that. Philippians 1 and Philippians 2. What I'm going to be talking about tonight, the title of the message is this. Let this mind be in you. As Christians, we should have this mind in each and every single one of us. It should be our desire. It should be our place that we go to because this mind does not originate with man. It does not originate with problems. It does not originate with our emotions, our faulty minds, but it originates with the mind of Christ. And so as Christians in the last days, and I truly believe that we're living in last days, there's no greater time to have this mind than right now. And I know you may look at me as a 25-year-old and say, well, he doesn't know anything. But I'm telling you, the, the, the reason that I believe that we're in the last days is not based upon my 25-year-old mind. It's based upon what we read in the Scripture. It's based upon what our pastor faithfully preaches. It's based upon the evidence and the things that we see in our world at this very moment happening, happening over in Israel, the Middle East, where all these prophecies take place all the things are pointing to something and not only that but there are those that in the midst of all these trials in the midst of all this stuff that is unfolding before our eyes they're saying you've said that he's been coming you said that he was going to come the fathers have promised that in times past and guess what them saying those very words adds more credibility to the fact that it is the last day or this is the last time these are the last days and so what greater time to be minded in the way that christ is minded than the day and a which we live so that being said, we're going to start in Philippians 1. We're going to start in verse number 3. I'm not going to read through all of Philippians, but I'm going to do one thing before that. I'm going to go ahead and pray one more time. You can't pray enough. And what I believe is that if we don't come in with open hearts, receptive, ready to receive the word of God, then the word of God is not going to be penetrating your heart because you've closed him out already. So let's do something different this evening. Let's come into church mindful and ready to receive what God has for us. And the way we do that is we go to that God in prayer. So I'm going to pray for myself, and I ask that you pray for yourself, that God would open your heart. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you, I'm so thankful for who you are. God, I'm thankful for, for all that you've given us and just how we understand who you are. I'm thankful that we can look into creation and, and, and the, the vastness of outer space and realize that an all-powerful being made that. And that all-powerful being loves us that live on this little dust uh, place called earth. And on that little place called earth, you zoom in a little bit further and there are these ant-looking things. And those ant-looking things are us as individuals. And yet we look so small in the vastness of all the universe. And yet you love us so much. And on God, I'm so thankful for who you are. I'm thankful for Jesus Christ and the salvation that we have because of what you've done for us. You've proven your love over and over and over again. And so God, as I come before you tonight, I ask that you would separate anything in my life that would hinder you from using me. God, I pray that you'd fill me full of your spirit. God, I pray that all the words that come through my mouth would be guided by the spirit. I pray that my mind and the thoughts that appear in my mind would be guided by the spirit. Bind Satan, bind the, bind the demons, bind anything that would try to hinder you from using me. It's not about me, God, and I don't want anyone to look up here and see me. I want them to see your word. I want them to see you using a vessel. God, I pray that they would be pointed towards you. If there's anybody in here today that does not know you as their savior, God, it's, the time is going. And I ask that right now you would preach a greater message with the Holy Spirit to their heart and convict them of their sin, show them their need for salvation. And for those of us that are Christians in here, God, I pray that you'd help us to live as though we were actually in the last days. God, I pray that you would allow this mind that we read about in Philippians 1 and 2 to be present in us. And God, I pray that you would guide me throughout the message, that you would get glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Philippians 1, verse number 3, it says this. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. When I was at California, uh, um, someone gave a message, and they, a phrase they said stuck out to me, and I didn't base this whole sermon off of a phrase that they said it it coupled with the scripture that God had already laid in my heart and so it coupled together and he said this phrase and it really stuck out to me he says it's common but it's not Christian and so today that could be the subtitle of my message the main message is let this mind be in you but what really happens in most of Christianity today is things that are common but they're nowhere found in the Bible it's not scriptural at all 
So I'm going to encourage us as a church to be mindful of the way that God wants us to live our life, to be mindful of the kind of mind that he wants us to have in our lives. And so as we dive into this passage of scripture, first I want to just focus on what Christianity is. And we looked in verse number three through six of first, uh, Philippians chapter number one. And first I think I see that there is fellowship together in the gospel. So what is the point of Christianity? It's all about the gospel. Yes, we find fellowship in it, but the focus is the gospel. And then you jump down to verse number six, and he says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ, of Jesus Christ. Not only is our focus the gospel, but there is a big emphasis on something else. Yes, we should be going out and trying to spread the gospel, but why is there such an emphasis on this? It's because it's a time-sensitive thing. The day of Christ is coming. And the day in which we're going to come and face to face with God whenever the rapture happens, and then there's only a little bit of time before the second coming happens, and prophecy is being fulfilled. Guys, a time is at hand. And so, yes, we need to be all about the gospel. And even more so, we need to be all about the gospel because the time is short, especially in the last days in which we live right now. And so I see the motivation of Christianity is to further the gospel with an emphasis on the time sensitivity of it. Now, us as Christians, and I'm going to not say, let me preface this. I am not bashing anything. What I'm about to say has nothing to do bashing nothing against our church. Our church is fantastic, and we are time sensitive, and we are all about furtherance of the gospel. So what I'm about to say is not directed towards us, but there are a lot of churches out here, and, and, and ours included, we have the mind focus on spreading the gospel. We have a good focus on spreading the gospel. And our pastor and the pastoral staff, I know we all think it's a time-sensitive issue. And there's a lot of church members that I believe they think it's a time-sensitive issue. But there's a lot of other church members who are are okay with spreading the gospel, but they've lost sight that it's time-sensitive. And so they're okay with all the the events that we have going on. They're okay with all the activities that we have going on. They're okay with all the the outreach that we we have going on, but they're not going to get involved with it because they really don't think... It's time sensitive. Us as Christians, we, not, we need to not forget what the first century church did. You want to realize why the first century church booms so big? It's because Christ said, I'm coming back. You know, And they're like, okay, okay, I, don't, I think it's, the time is at hand. We got to get this thing out because I need everyone to get saved because Jesus is coming. And I only have this little bit of time to get him before he comes. He's coming. I'm looking for him. We're looking up. And that's what we've lost as a church. We've lost the idea that, oh, he's coming and he's coming soon. Guys, if you see what is going on, there's no doubt. There's no doubt whether it's a year from now, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's 10 years. I have no idea. But the time is at hand. And we only have this little bit of time to live for the gospel. So the motivation is the gospel, the furtherance of it. And it's emphasized by the time, sensitive, the time sensitivity of the message that we have to proclaim. We go to verse number 9 in 1 Philippians. It says this, and this I pray. That your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. That ye may approve things that are excellent. That ye may be sincere and without fence till the day of Christ. There it is again. Uh It's not the main focus of this book of the Bible, but he cannot help but include it in the Bible. That the time is at hand. The day of Christ is coming one of these days. It's going to be here before you realize it. Verse number 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Uh which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Then he says this, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. You know Paul's life, what it was about? The furtherance of the gospel. You know this church, what it was all about? The furtherance of the gospel. Their focus was on the furtherance of the gospel, and that is our motivation in Christianity today, and that's what it should be. Now we're going to jump over to Philippians chapter number 2, verses 1 through 4, and we're going to see the mandate of Christianity. In verse number 1, it says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bows and mercies, fulfill ye my joy. What is his joy? That ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So the mandate of Christianity, and it's how it was all throughout the first century church, is that we should have the mind of Christ, and we should be focused on the furtherance of the gospel. And how do we do that? is by getting our eyes off of ourselves and our eyes on all those around us. 
Those that are out there in the world, it shouldn't be about me, my business, my dreams, my goals, my desires, the things that I have planned in my future. It should not be about that. And that's what Christianity is today. It's all about, I love Jesus on Wednesday nights. I love Jesus on Sunday mornings. I love Jesus on Sunday nights and the occasional activity that we do. But aside from that, you have no room in my life, Jesus. That's not what it should be. The furtherance of the gospel should be everything that we do. It should govern how you run your business. Yes, you can have goals for your business, but it should be centered on the fact that how can I use my business to further the gospel? Because that's my priority in life. It's not about what I can make. It's not about how much more money I can get. It's not about how many more things I can have. Guys, I want to tell you something. I want a lot, okay? As a man, there's a lot of things that I want. And I've just come to realize as a Christian, there are things that I'm never going to have. Now, there's a difference between a man and a Christian. A Christian is one that sets aside all the things that he wants because he's looking at the things of others. And so I'm going to give you a little a bit of an example and, uh, of, some, of a story that I know uh, of an individual. They were, getting rid of, they were getting rid of a washer and a dryer, and they had this thought in their mind. They said, well, I can get rid of this washer and dryer, and I can charge somebody for it. But instead, you know what I want to do? I want to give this washer and dryer away for free because when I do that, I'm going to witness to whoever is going to get this washer and dryer. And so the person gave away the washer and dryer, and uh, the person, there, someone came, and, and they got it, and he, that, the individual knew this other individual, and he witnessed to him, and that individual got saved, okay? That individual got saved. But not only did that individual get saved, he brought his entire family to church. And not only did he bring his entire family to church, but there was his brother that came to church. And guess what? His brother got saved. And guess who that brother was? The same one that welcomed us into service this morning, okay, or this evening. That is what happens whenever you have your mind not focused on what I can gain, but on the furtherance of the gospel, okay? It should govern every action that we have. It should govern every decision that we make. It should be all that we are because Christ has been everything to us. So the furtherance of the gospel, we see the mandate is that we should be like-minded and we should be focused on others. We should be focused on others. If you are focused on others, then you are going to be like-minded with the thought of Christianity and how I can get this gospel out. That's how the church was. Right? They were all together coming in cahoots saying, okay, let's send Paul here. Okay, let's see Barnabas here. Let's do all this so the whole world can know why the time is at hand. And so they were so focused on this thing and they were so steadfast about being like-minded one another because there was no time to quarrel. There was no time to get sidetracked. There was no time for divisions to be allowed into the church. Why? Because the time was at hand. It's all about Jesus. It's about the gospel. And we need to get this message out. So let's work together. That's what we should be as Christianity. That's the mandate. Keep on looking. We're going to see what the mind of Christianity is. Look with me in verses 5 through 8 of chapter number 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto, the de unto death, even the death of of the cross. So what mind is God saying I want you to have? I want you to have the mind of Christ. And what does that look like? Jesus said, or we see it here in this passage of scripture, that Jesus came not to be somebody, but to be a servant. And so every single Christian, guess what God wants you to do? Be a servant. Amen. That's what he wants. He doesn't want you to be the big guy. He doesn't want you to be boasting. He doesn't want you to figure out all for yourself. He said, I want you to serve those around you. Not only did he say he's a servant, but he said how far, how much of a servant was he that he was willing to sacrifice Everything, yes. everything, right. his entire life Amen. for those around him. It was all about the furtherance of the gospel. He was carrying out, he was living out the gospel. Literally, Jesus was living out the gospel. Why? He was focused on others. And if we as Christians are going to see some major salvation happen in the lives around us in the last days, then we got to be focused on the gospel. And how we focus on the gospel? By looking at everybody else and saying, I'm not just going to look at you. I'm not just going to serve you but I'll give up my own things Amen. that you might come to know him, yes. that you might be changed. I'm going to stop putting so much towards this, stop putting so much towards either my vacation fund or other stuff because missions, guess what? Missions around the world, they need, they need the gospel. The missionaries need funding so that they can go and preach the gospel. And, you know, if you're not willing to be a missionary, the least you can do is sacrifice some stuff here in America so the missionaries that are willing to go to these other countries can actually do what they're supposed to do. All right? We need to be giving of ourselves. It's not just a servanthood, but it's a sacrificial servanthood. My entire life, Jesus says, I gave my all, literally everything, literally everything. 
for the furtherance of the gospel. And so that's what we should be. The Bible tells us, in other words, God is saying, let this mind be in you. The one that was in my son, the one you claim to love, the one you claim to follow, let this mind be in you. So, we see the mind of Christianity. You want to focus on a little bit, you can look at 9 through 11, you can see the magnificence of Christianity. Yes, sir. And that, well, we'll go ahead and read them. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Guess what? Everyone's going to confess it. Why not get them to confess it on this side of eternity, right? And so we see that all, all of this, it's all for him, right? Pastor John doesn't do what he does so that he can get boasted and, and uplifted. I promise you he gets a lot more hate than he gets encouragement, okay? It's not so that he can get boasted up. It's so that he can boast up the one that can save all of mankind, Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. Now let's go to verse 14 through 16, and we'll see another emphasis here. 14, it says this, Do all things without murmurings and disputings. That's hard for Baptists. That you may, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We are lights, and we are living in a crooked and perverse nation. So let us so shine and not dim our lights. Let us not hide our lights. Verse number 16, Holding forth, the word of life, that I may rejoice in the, what is that? The day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Three times in a book that's not even talking about the second coming, that's not even talking about the future events, he cannot help but get away from this thing. It's a time-sensitive issue, guys. And as Christians that are literally living in the last day, it is a time-sensitive issue. So for the next little bit, I'm going to go over a couple of passages of scripture that can just encourage you and tell you that we're living in the last day. I'm going to go to multiple places in the Bible that tell us the time is at hand. This is not Josh Westfall. This is not Pastor Smith. This is Jesus Christ saying, yo, listen, the time is at hand. Matthew 24, 42 says, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Matthew 24, 44 says, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Philippians 4, 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That is the Antichrist. He's saying the Antichrist is already ready, but there's something that is let him allow him to be here. We read the rest of it. It says, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That's the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit's gone, guess what? The Antichrist has nowhere, nothing stopping him from, show, from revealing himself. In other words, it's already at work, meaning it can happen now. All right? Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. Promise what? That he's coming. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. You know what I'm trying to do today? I'm trying to exhort you to realize that the time is at hand so that we can live the life that Christ wants us to live and have this mind be in us, that we might go out and make a difference for the gospel of Christ before he says, yo, it's time we're going up, okay? We look in 1 Peter 4, 7, but the end of all things is at hand, therefore, be, or be ye therefore sober and watch under prayer. 2 Peter 3, 9 through 12 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Verse number 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. When you come down to verse number 12, it says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Revelation 1, 3, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Revelation 3, 11, behold, Jesus Christ, I come quickly. Behold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. Revelation 22, 10 says, and he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of this prophecy of this book, talking about Revelation, for the time is at hand. He's saying, don't get away. Don't put this off to the side. Show everybody because the time is at hand. We look at another place and it says, and behold, I come quickly. That is Jesus Christ. And my reward is with me to give every man according to as his work shall be. All right, that notice that is according to his work, not my, my, I'm not getting rewarded for Lance's work. I'm getting rewarded for my work. And Lance is not getting rewarded for Bill's work. Uh, he's getting rewarded for his own work. So if you ain't doing nothing, Lance, you ain't getting nothing, right? All right, we look in for Revelation 22, 20. It says, he which testifieth these things saith, Jesus Christ, the second to last verse in the entire Bible, surely I come quickly. Amen. So what is God trying to tell us? Time is at hand. And so us as Christians, 
We need to be about the furtherance of the gospel, no matter the cost. The example is Christ, and he said, I gave it all. So no matter what it will cost you, be about the furtherance of the gospel. Be more focused and realize that it is a time-sensitive issue that we need to get on board with. So that being said, I'm going to go over what Christianity isn't. And for the next little bit, do not throw your stones at me, okay? For the next little bit, let's examine ourselves. Let's be honest with ourselves uh, because this convicted my heart, and maybe it will convict your heart as well. It's common. This is common, but it's not Christian. Not wanting this mind to be in your children. Ooh, there's a lot of people that discourage children into the ministry. I was one. Also, I know others personally that were discouraged whenever they tried to get into the ministry by parents. Notice what happens in the Bible. Hannah gave Samuel. In 1 Samuel 1.11, and she vowed a vow and said, Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. You know what? In other words, he's saying, you can have my child. God, you can have them, not for a moment, not for a little bit, but his entire life. He is yours. I just want you to bless me with this child so that I can give them right back to you and he can be used by you. And not only that, but she said, I'm going to so separate this child. He's not going to be able to do all the things the other kids are doing. He's not going to be able to go all the places the other kids are going. No razor is going to come upon his head. He's going to be different. And I'm giving him to you, God. So according to Hannah, it's not Christian to do that, uh, to, to not allow this mind to be in your children. According to Moses' mother, it's not, uh, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not Christian to allow this mind to be in your child. Guess what Moses', Moses mother did? She entrusted Moses entirely to the Lord. She took care of her child as much as she could. Then it came to a place and she could no longer hide him. She took him for an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with, and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. In other words, I'm laying this child here and I'm trusting entirely that if he's going to be safe, he's going to be safest in God's hands. So I'm going to put him here. I'm going to walk away. If I, hold him with me, if I try to hold on to this child, it is going to destroy him. But if I give this child to Jesus or I give this child to God because they didn't know Jesus' name then, if I give this child to God, then God is going to be able to take care of this child. And you know what happens? Something fascinating. God takes care of the child. The child is found by Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter calls out a Hebrew woman to raise the child and to nurse the child. And that Hebrew woman was the child's mother. So the child's mother, because she entrusted God with the, uh, the, the child to God, then she was able to raise her child. She was able to nurse her child. And instead of being paid for slave labor, she was paid to be a parent to her own child. That's what you get whenever you trust God with your children. He blesses you in ways you never understood. We only see that Abraham offered up Isaac to the Lord. So in according to Abraham, yeah, it is not Christian to, to hide your child from God or say, you child, you can't serve. And you know what happened here is that Abraham said, hey, Isaac, Okay, he's Abraham because he's old, right? I'm Isaac because I'm... <laughs> this is Abraham, and he's given to Isaac the wood to carry to be the offering, okay? So he gives to Isaac the wood to carry to be a sacrifice to Almighty God. But Abraham had faith. He said, you know what? I believe that God is not just going to take my son, but he's promised life through my son, so I'm going to trust that God will raise him from the dead. And not only see that, but the greatest example of all, and I don't have much more time, is that God sent his only son, his only begotten son, not to just suffer a little bit, but to die, to take it all for all of humanity. So it is not Christian to not want your child to be in service to the Lord. And so if you have been nixing your child from being in service to the Lord, you have all the excuses. I've heard them all. You have all the excuses. But what? let this child go to, go to college first. In other words, let something else get in the way of the child's future before they can fully surrender themselves to God. Let me do this first, and then my child can follow you. Well, if you look in the Gospels, you see how that worked out for Jesus, uh, calling those couple to come and follow him. The first said, well, let me go bury the dead. The second one said, let me go tell them goodbye. And Jesus said, if you do that, you're not fit for the kingdom. So if you're trying to say, let them do this first, it's never going to be fit for God. And you keep on going and you say, well, they won't be able to support themselves. Look at me, okay? I'm not supporting myself. God has supported me. And I am in full-time ministry. Well, I was, uh, I was working in a hot dog stand. And I dropped out of college because God said, I want you to preach. So I surrendered everything. And I said, I'm going to go preach. I was also trying to be a financial advisor. And God said, I want you to preach. And I said, well, I'm done with this. I'm going to go preach. And so I dropped everything. I'm working at a hot dog stand. And then God provided me this. And you say, well, not every church is like our church. And I say, if you're trying to trust in a man or a church or an organization or a degree or anything else to supply for your child, your trust is in the wrong spot. I trust in God. 
And if your child is going to make it, it's because they trust in God. Amen. And if you're going to allow your child to be something great for God, then you're going to have the trust in God. Or how do we get saved? By faith. And, and, and how do we continue in the life that we live as a Christian? By faith. And so we need to do that. Also, if you look at all these examples, not only was the parent willing, but the child was willing. And this is, can be applied to every single person, even if you're not a parent. The child was willing to go. Samuel said, here am I. Moses actually said, here am I. But in he, he went before Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Okay? And not only did he say, let my people go, but then we go to Abraham. And Isaac said, oh, where's the lamb? Where's the ram for the sacrifice? And, his, and then his dad, Abraham, said, oh, God will provide himself a lamb. But Isaac knew as he was carrying that wood that he was going to be the sacrifice. And his old, his old father, he said, okay, you can buy me father you know and, and you can lay me on this altar father I could easily get up and run but I'm going to allow this to happen because I'm willing to be offered for the Lord just as you are willing to offer me so if you're in here today realize that yes you should be willing for your children to go but even if you don't have children us every individual Christian should be willing to look up to God and say here am I Amen. here am I send me Amen. you look at Jesus Christ you know what it says he said my meat is to do the will of the one that sent me. The greatest example is Jesus. Sorry, Pastor, I went a little bit over, but here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. Maybe if you're a parent in here and you've been trying to do this Christianity thing, but really what you've been doing is a thing that's common. Maybe today when you go home, you should tell your child, whether or not God calls them to something specific, you should tell your child, if God does call you, I'm going to support you. I'm going to be with you wholeheartedly all the way. And uh, maybe... Maybe, just maybe, you're the Christian in here that should look up your eyes and say, here am I, send me. Because you want to know why? We are living in the last day. We should be about the Father's business. It should all be about the furtherance of the gospel. And guess what? Christ said, pray that the Lord would send forth laborers, for the fields are white unto harvest. You know what we're lacking? We're lacking preachers. We're lacking missionaries. We're lacking pastor's wives. We're lacking those that are willing to spread the gospel in their daily lives, whether you're a preacher or not, whether, I mean, you're a pastor or not. You need to spread the gospel in your daily life. Every single day, spread the gospel. That's what we need to be about in these last days. Everyone, bow your heads, close your eyes for a quick second. Is there anybody in here today, let me first ask this question. Is there anybody in here today that does not know that they'd go to heaven if they were to die? You're not 100% sure you'd go to heaven if you were to die. If, you, if, you, if that's you, raise your hand. No one's looking. It's just me. All right. This is why I figured the majority of us in here claim to be Christian. That being said, are you a common Christian or are you a Christian? There's a difference. Are you a common Christian or are you a biblical Christian? Today and the day and age which we live, there's no time for common Christianity. It's time that we get set apart. If that means I gotta sacrifice more of my things so that I can give to those that are willing to go, so be it. If it's I'm gonna sacrifice all of my things like we are commanded to do and to go, that is what we're looking for here tonight. If God laid upon your heart that you have not been living up to the life that we should be living, this altar is open for you to come and pray. And now would be the time to do so. If everyone stay with your heads bowed, but go ahead and stand. Keep your heads bowed, keep your eyes closed. Give respect to those that wanna come and pray. Now is the time to move. We live in the last day. Be devoted. Be the kind of Christian that God can use to reach somebody else. It takes servanthood. It takes sacrifice. It takes this mind being in us. And that mind is the furtherance of the gospel with an emphasis on the time being at hand. And also for our eyes to be on others and not the things of ourself. Let's go ahead and end in a word of prayer, but I wanna do this. Each and every single individual, I believe that even though you may not have moved, uh, not all of you have moved, I believe that this, a message like this that doesn't come from me, but it comes from the word of God, is bound to prick your heart in some way. So respond to the Holy Spirit right now. In your seat, where you are, as I pray, pray that God would help you to be a more faithful Christian. Dear Heavenly Father, as I come before you, God, I'm so thankful for your word and the, and, and the challenge that we find in it. God, you've given us purpose in life. It's not just to live how we want to live. It's to live for you and to be steadfast for the gospel's sake. We saw countless passages that talk about the time being at hand. And so God, help us to realize this is a time-sensitive matter. That there are those that are out there that are dying, and who knows, it could literally happen tonight. 
God, we see the things going on in Israel, and God, I pray that you'd help us as Christians in this time to be emboldened, to go and spread the gospel. Help us to be sacrificial. Help us to be servants. Help us not to look at our businesses, our dreams, our goals, our parents' desires for ourselves, but help us to look at those of others and their needs, the need of the gospel. God, I help us to be what you want us to be so that we can be used by you in the way you want us to be used by you. It's common, the things that we see in Christianity today, but it's definitely not Christian. So help us to live the biblical Christian way. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.